tech. All right, awesome. We should All right. be able to screen share. Yeah, let me do that. Oh, um, now. Yeah. Think... yeah. Okay, great. So I can screen share now. Um, all right. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Awesome. All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the Disputandum team for asking me to uh, do this um, workshop. I think it is really, really important that we talk about adjudication. Even if you have never judged before, uh, I think this like workshop can still be helpful for you. And even if your primary goal is to just debate better, I actually think that adjudication is a pathway to making sure that you uh, debate better as well. Or at the very least, if we're talking about BP debating, to not get fourths or to maximize your chances of breaking. Um, so a wide variety of uh, benefits come from adjudication. So we'll just start. Um, what I'm going to cover in this um, workshop primarily is to understand or decipher the world's judging manual. Realistically, if you want to be a good judge, the one thing that you should do is to just read through the manual, study it, memorize it, and practice it. Um, there really isn't any other way to it. Like you could probably just practice it, but then you would end up not getting as, um, as much benefits as, as you would if you just like, like read through the manual. So um, most of this presentation will be me extracting excerpts from the world's manual um, and explaining to you how I interpret it and how a lot of other judges interpret it, what I've learned throughout the way, um, and how you can uh, sort of become a better judge by being very specific um, and very meticulous in your approach to deciding for its, um, like, like the first place position to the fourth place position. So it will largely be about BP judging though there is a lot of applicability to other forms of debating or other styles of debating like world schools and AP. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to talk about three different things in this presentation. So, oh, so when this is uploaded to YouTube, um, hopefully there might be timestamps later on, but if there aren't any timestamps, I'll make it clear when I'm going to each section. So first is just why care about good judging, um, and that will mostly cover stuff on um, judge briefings and what you have to look out for or what I've seen as big problems in um, judges not really following it. Secondly is like certain methods that you can use to improve as a judge. Some of these might be subjective, um, but it is sort of like a path that I've observed in many other judges as well as I've talked to them. Um, and lastly, just a, like a short discussion on international judging. Um, if you want to ever break through to, um, to that, a lot of benefits there. You can get to meet a lot of people. Um, you get money, um, you get to judge really great debates, and it's sort of like, in my perspective, getting paid to learn about debating, which is always a great thing. So first is, why care about good judging? So like I said um, initially, I think it is the secret step to debating well um, and winning on strategy, even when you like just know near to nothing about emotion. If you look at it, um, or if you've watched a lot of debates, um, either like online or anywhere else, you'll like realize that a lot of times debaters don't really use regular language or like they use like language that is specific to how judges adjudicate debates or how judges determine first to fourths. Um, and I think it is a very important tool to weigh your arguments. And also when you're judging, obviously you care about doing it well, right? So, and here I have a list of things that you probably look at a lot whenever you um, see judge briefings. So um, in every kind of judge briefing, they tell you similar things all the time because most of them just use the same exact um, briefing or the same exact presentation, right? You have to be an average intelligent voter, fair application of burdens, um, track the debate well, track um, like the debate with your good notes. Um, you don't have to prefer one type of argument. You have to check your biases, et cetera. Um, I won't go through what it means to be an average intelligent voter. Um, what I will go through, however, are the things that I think a lot of um, judges miss out on because there is a heavy emphasis in saying, here's what it means to be an average intelligent voter. There isn't enough emphasis on other criteria for judging, which makes a lot of people slip up when they determine calls, for example, or when they determine clashes or reasons for why that call is as such. So. What are those expectations of judging that a lot of people overlook? Maybe you as well. 
myself included, uh, before I started judging frequently. There are three different um, expectations that I think are um, oftentimes overlooked. First is um, that a lot of judges oftentimes still prefer one type of argument. Second is that they deal with rule violations incorrectly. And lastly is um, they don't credit style, um, which is, is important for you not to credit style, but I'll explain to you why it might be something to reconsider when you are judging. Um, and I also actually like, like left out this tiny thing here. Um, it's to run panel discussion as well. So um, broadly, these things um, are the ones that I will focus on because I think these are the ones that seem really, really ambiguous. Um, it's unclear how do you not prefer one type of argument when teams make it clear sort of like a practical impact is better than a principal impact because it is a practical impact. Like oftentimes the weighing that teams use is very circular, but it works because um, it seems like um, there is no way to rebut that claim. Um, so how do you judge appropriately based on these expectations that are found in the judging manual? So in terms of argumentative preferences, when you are judging, it is extremely important that you do not come in with a preference for an argument for teams to bring. You can come in with a preference for burdens that they ought to fulfill. For instance, if the motion tells them specifically it's a this house would motion, you would obviously expect that teams debate on the premise that this is a policy that they're supposed to be arguing for whether or not we should enact this policy in contrast to just a general value judgment on whether or not this policy is good. So what should you not do? You should not judge a debate on purely utilitarian metrics because that is judging on a moral assumption because you are coming in with a framework of not being an average reasonable voter. You are coming in on a subjective framework, which is to say that you are judging on what you think is best for teams to argue in contrast to what teams tell you is best to argue. So this is referenced in the judging manual, um, just to, to make sure that we're very, very clear on how um, the stuff that I'm talking about here isn't just some, some random um, input that doesn't really apply. Um, a lot of this stuff is explained in the judging manual. And I think the best way to deal with this then, because obviously, you know, like judges, they can be biased. I'm biased. A lot of people are biased, uh, but we try our best to deal with those biases. Um, the best thing to do then as a judge is to assess arguments by their argumentative strength, um, their closeness to fulfilling burdens, and the weighing that is provided by teams. So those three kind of metrics are always universally true um, when we're talking about judging, and especially when we're talking about judging in different circuits. So that's one of the things that I think is important to emphasize. Um, do not come into a debate expecting that practical arguments are more important. So it's like if teams argue that um, this creates a benefit and therefore this wins, or another team argues this creates a principle and therefore it is certain. Um, you don't credit the principle just because it is a principle. You credit the principle because they explained it on a comparative lens. So because it weighs higher than practical arguments, for example. That's one of the things. Um, the other thing that I want to deconstruct here is just ways that we as judges have to deal with rule violations. I think it is just a fact that in some of the debates, if not most of the debates um, that we adjudicate, there, there can sometimes be teams that violate the rules, right? They make a contradiction in a clarification. They make a contradiction in a rebuttal. Like um, the first speaker of the opening government team might say something like, yeah, we're gonna give them a lot of money and giving them a lot of money is good because a lot of money makes them happy. Um, and then the second speaker maybe comes up and says, well, no, a lot of money might not necessarily make someone happy. What really makes someone happy is um, anything else other than money. I'm not sure. Um, let's say they make a contradiction, right? It is unhelpful and it is actually quite um, like detrimental to you as a judge to over penalize teams on that metric. So for example, um, you can't come into a um, OA and say something like opening government makes a contradiction and therefore their case is less persuasive than the opening opposition. That might be the case, but it doesn't follow therefore that because of the contradiction, their case is less persuasive. What is true, however, is maybe an opening like government team lost a clash to the opening opposition. Maybe it's the case that their analysis doesn't way up higher to opening opposition's analysis because opening opposition gives 
um, stronger mechanisms or stronger reasons to believe that another thing is true. What you should do, basically, whenever there is a rule violation, is to just ignore the material. And this is telling as well that the world's judging manual has the word ignore written nine times, because that is oftentimes the, or not oftentimes, but rather like the standard by which you um, judge um, rule violations. So you ignore the material. You don't say, um, this is a contradiction, therefore you lose. Um, that, is, that is never the case. What is the case, however, is you have to take that out and you have to assess the case based on everything else that the team brings you. This also, I think, is a good exercise because that allows you to evaluate the debate in a much more rich way. And it doesn't allow, say, like very generalized reasons for why a team loses. So you can say something like, um, when comparing opening government and opening opposition, I focus on this one specific clash because in this other clash, the opening government makes a contradiction and the opening opposition doesn't appropriately weigh the clash and doesn't prove why their reasons are stronger than opening government's clash. So on this clash, the let's say the, the opening government is stronger and therefore opening government wins over opening op, right? In that case, that would be a justified reason for why the opening government team wins. And it also gives debaters sort of um, a sense of like, like um, that you are like hearing them um, in contrast to you just um, ignoring their material entirely because second speaker made a tiny mistake in contradiction, right? If it is the case that second, like, like the second speaker makes a um, really horrible contradiction to the point where the whole case doesn't work, then that would be an exception. But the point here is over penalizing teams is never a good thing. And it's also important just because you want to make sure that teams don't, uh, you know, feel like they're not heard. You want to make sure that they, they do feel heard. Yeah. So, okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about style because this might be a bit controversial. Um, in BP debating, we all generally know that style isn't factored into the decision. Style is sort of just a nice additional thing that you have from speakers, um, and it makes it easier for you, let's say, to write your notes, or it makes it more pleasant to um, hear. So it isn't, and it still isn't, um, a metric for judging. However, it doesn't mean that style is irrelevant. And I'm just here taking a screenshot from um, a judge briefing posted by the world's um, CA team or made by the world CA team. So essentially, when we're talking about style in BP debating, um, it is an unreasonable expectation to say that we should never ever care about style um, and like, like therefore not even think about um, how it might affect the persuasiveness of an argument, right? Um, style oftentimes can make an argument a bit more compelling, right? They make it more comprehensible, uh, they clearly and precisely convey the speaker's meaning. They effectively convey the emotional, moral, practical, or other significance of the speaker's claim. So there are like clear benefits to um, judging speakers with good style, right? So um, again, I think this kind of like this this bullet point here sort of summarizes the case quite well, which is that it's it's wrong to think that arguments can be assessed through pure, cold, emotionless logic. Um, it's it's more appropriate to say that average reasonable voters, oh sorry, average reasonable voters probably um, can understand um, stylistically strong speeches a bit better, right? Um, the last thing to note is just that like like rhetoric cannot cannot replace logical analysis, but it can amplify the effect of your logical analysis. Um, so what does that mean? Um, how do you how do you sort of like deal with all this then? Um, Debate is still an art of persuasion, even in BP debating. Um, so it doesn't hurt for you to observe the language and the tone of the speeches, especially when, let's say, speakers try to emphasize a point of weighing for you. It might be the case that a speaker emphasizes um, the importance of an argument in a very stylistic way. Your job is to acknowledge that that style might persuade you, um, but also then be skeptical of the like analysis provided because it might be the case that that is just fluff and it might just be um, you know, something that doesn't really prove an argument weighs higher, right? So a couple of takeaways, right? The first takeaway is that you have to check your biases and observe if closing government or closing opposition's material is a more persuasive iteration of the open case or if it is actually derivative. You have to ask yourself, was the rhetorical analysis purely just fluff or did it characterize a case better, right? So 
the way that you settle this essentially is to one, I think have really good notes, but secondly as well is to just make sure that you're always comparative in your assessment. So whenever you do encounter good style in a speech, um, assess it against material that you heard in the opening speeches. Um, did this explain a clash a bit better? What was it a like completely new clash? And they were able to explain why um, this new clash um, outweighs previous clashes in the debate, right? Um, there isn't really like a set step-by-step -step, um, like, like method for you to follow um, in order to make sure that you know how to make a differentiation on this. I think it does just come by practice, but it is important for you to take note of this foundation and take note that style can, can be persuasive, um, accepting that in the same way that we accept that we have biases, but we try to work through those biases when we're judging. Um, and also, you should look out for ways that speakers portray their outcomes. So did it sufficiently prove their argument's importance? Did other teams outframe those claims? And as well, if you're um, here to also learn a bit more about how to speak a bit better or how to debate better, um, you should exclusively prioritize comprehensibility, clarity in the meaning of your arguments, um, and effectively conveying the emotional, moral, practical, or other significance of your claim. So some of that, I think, cannot be done entirely divorced from style. Um, you can sort of look at style in a way that aids in, in this um, like, like venture, essentially, of trying to um, sound more comprehensible, prioritize clarity. Yeah. So again, um, I, or I just want to note as well that like accents do not do not um, like like matter at all in DB debating. Like it absolutely never is a factor. But style is is different from from accents. Style is more about um, clarity, about comprehensibility, um, about how it conveys um, you know all these things that that you have right here. So uh, that's just a note there. I think is is important for 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 judges because. Um, we are like supposed to be average reasonable voters. Um, I think it probably is a pretty bad expectation to say that you have to judge a debate as you would um, as like a robot, right? Like you're not supposed to be a robot. You're supposed to be persuaded by teams, you're supposed to find it um, an exciting kind of activity overall, yeah? And finally, I just wanna talk a little bit about settling clashes. Um, so just going through common mistakes or common misconceptions because I myself have gone through these um, misconceptions when judging, right? So sometimes speakers can have five different mechanisms for an argument and another speaker by and large uses empirical analysis to prove their argument. So for example, if like, um, how do we say this? Um, let's say it's a motion about, let's take like the most basic motion, this house would ban smoking. Um, the opening government, let's say, does something like, there are five different reasons for why smoking is harmful, um, five mechanisms, right? Then the opening opposition says something along the lines of, um, there is one reason why a ban is um, not helpful to settle the harms of smoking. That one mechanism beats out the five mechanisms from opening government, because while opening government was able to prove that smoking is harmful, they were not able to prove that a ban is able to overstep the harm of smoking or to stop people from smoking, while opening opposition was able to suggest that this policy is ineffective and therefore is stronger than the opening government. Right? So you can see then from that brief exercise or brief analogy that a quantity of mechanisms do not prove or do not make a team immediately stronger than another team. It's rather the collective persuasiveness of an argument or the way that they prove it is comparatively stronger than another argument. Right. So make sure we take note of that. Quantity of mechanisms do not equate to a stronger argument. Secondly, though, we should not arbitrarily prioritize impacts or mechanization. So this is something that I think is pretty tricky because it's sort of like a chicken and egg problem, right? Which come first, um, mechanisms or impacts? They probably both need to exist in order for an argument to work, right? If you don't have mechanisms, you don't really have a logical link. If you don't have impacts, you don't have a um, conclusion. So that means there is just a premise. There isn't really a conclusion, right? So both, I think, could be equally important. What you should do as a judge is to prioritize what points of analysis are proven to be logically necessary for an argument to run. Um, I'll take the smoking example again here. This house would ban smoking. Um, 
the opening government proves why smoking is an absolute bad. Um, it's so, so harmful. It just, um, it, it deteriorates your, your mind. It, it debilitates you, blah, 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 right? All of that is just impacts, right? Impacts for why smoking is really harmful. Um, and then closing government talks about maybe about how, um, you know, a ban can be like, can be necessary for, um, for people to, um, for people to stop smoking or it becomes a strong deterrence mechanism, right? At face value, you might think the closing government immediately wins over the opening government, right? Because obviously they prove that the policy is necessary. But if you look at it a bit further, let's say the opening government weighs that regardless of any practical implications, governments have to do this because it is principally right for them to do, because it is consistent with every other venture that they do, and because it is a state duty or, or, or a fiduciary duty to their citizens. And let's say the closing government doesn't do any of that weighing and instead only prove general reasons for why if something is banned, you are less likely to use um, or to, um, to do that bad thing. If opening government is able to prove that practical impacts or practical um, analyses are less important to the principle of what governments ought to do, opening government wins over closing government. Because even though closing government proves that a ban is necessary, they do not weigh that um, a ban is something that has to be done. Opening government does weigh that by a principled argument, right? This is where it gets tricky because realistically, any argument can win over any other argument. But what you have to do is you have to look at what points of analysis are logically necessary for an argument to run. And in that case, it really is just based on the debate and based on what teams try to argue. And the last thing I wanna note here is that it's not about, just like you don't settle clashes by airtime allocated to an argument. Um, you settle clashes by um, a team's method of weighing um, said argument to be the most important in the round using metrics of weighing that I think are widely known. Um, this is like more impactful, this proves the argument in some kind of meaningful way, um, et cetera, right? So teams essentially will give that to you um, and you should uh, try to look out for those, yeah? I hope all of that is helpful. Again, if you do have questions, feel free to ask them after uh, the presentation. We'll now move on to the second part, which is methods that I have used to improve, or I think a lot of other people have used to improve in judging. So I will just cover four different things here. Um, we'll get into the first one right now. Um, actually, no way, I'll just go through these first. Uh, so um, first is I'll just talk about like judging the debate on a widely applied metric. Um, what does that mean? What is a widely applied metric? Um, secondly, judges or, or, or myself should try to be actively skeptical of all the material um, heard from speakers. Um, and I'll tell you about how to do that. Third, and this is quite important actually, is you should credit teams fairly. Um, and I put in brackets there as if you were their coach. Um, what do I mean by that, though? I don't mean that you should give an away by saying, here's why OG is bad, and here's what you should do to improve. Here's why OO is bad. Here's what you should do to improve. That's, that's bad adjudication. Good adjudication is you explaining to the teams why they lost comparative to other teams, and then saying the, like, the specific reason for why they lost. So maybe it was the fact that like, they didn't provide impacts for this argument, but the other team who was able to provide impacts proved that that was more necessary to the analysis that came from previous speakers, right? You should never say that they lost the debate because they didn't bring material that you thought was important. You should explicitly just say that you like didn't win the debate because you didn't um, fulfill the burden that you set out to fulfill while another team was able to fulfill that burden, let's say in the same bench, right? So um, there's a like nuance there. Um, you're not supposed to just give an OA as if you were their coach. Um, you're supposed to just credit teams fairly in the same way that we credit them fairly when we ignore um, contradictory material, but still credit material that isn't contradictory that might have been persuasive from their speeches. And finally, I just think this is like, at this point, a universal structure that honestly, every judge should use. Um, my personal opinion, if you have a different structure that you want, like to use when you're judging, feel free. But in my opinion, I think a set OA structure that goes chronologically is the best way for you to make sure you credit all teams well, make sure you never miss an important point, and make sure that you compare um, compare uh, like, like material from different teams um, in the most effective way. So I'll go through what, what that looks like later. In terms of the widely applied metric, um, here's what the 
uh, world's judging manual says. So how, like, it's always um, a bit odd when we ask, like, um, you should become an average reasonable voter. Like, what is average um, and what does reasonable mean, right? Um, the best way to sum it up is through these four steps. Um, so like before we go through those four steps though, I think um, it's just important to note that when you try to assess a debate, even in BP, right? In BP specifically, you should use burdens that are implied by the motion um, and also use burdens that are implied by the analysis that teams take up. So um, I think the first one there is pretty self-explanatory, right? Um, like if it's implied by the motion, like this house, um, believes that the US should place sanctions on Russia. Um, it's implied by the motion that you, or like this house um, as the US rather should, should place sanctions on Russia. It's implied by the motion that the, um, like the burden is of the US interest, right? So you probably have to talk about that. If you don't talk about the US interest, it's almost impossible for you to win. Um, but what do I mean by implied by the analysis that teams take up? Um, here's the example from the world's manual that I think I'll just have to, I just have to like reiterate because I think it sums it up quite well. Um, uh, let's say the motion was this house believes that assassination is a legitimate tool of foreign policy. Um, let's say the LO um, argues that assassination is a severe breach of international law, right? So that's the argument. Um, assassination is a severe breach of international law. Leader of opposition cannot simply prove that it is a severe breach, but they also have to prove that a severe breach, which is something that is illegal, is important to assess what is illegitimate, right? So the motion doesn't say this house believes that assassination is a illegal tool or, or like a, a legal tool. The motion says this house believes that assassination is a legitimate tool, right? So what constructs legitimacy is also up for debate, right? So the LO needs to prove that illegality matters for illegitimacy. Um, and if the deputy prime minister um, takes that down and states that um, and states in their in their case that assassination is illegal, but that illegality is a poor basis because the legal system is corrupt or whatnot. They're going to win over opening up, even if they fully prove mechanistically um, in the best way possible that um, assassination is a severe breach of um, international law. Right. So that's sort of where the dynamics of debate come in, and and why you have to assess very very um, like meticulously when judging. Right. So. The four steps that are very important. First step is to ask yourself, is there one criterion or principle that all teams explicitly agree is true and important? So I'll use this example actually, and, and let's say that all teams in the debate, all OG, OO, CGCO, agree that illegality is the premise by which we like measure just like legitimacy because that is the most um, common conception of legitimacy. Maybe that means that all teams have to argue on that basis, right? Uh, and if they all kind of agree on that basis, then that's the criteria that you use or the metric that you use to judge the debate. You see which teams were best able to prove that. Let's say, however, that teams disagree on that criteria. If there isn't one um, universal criteria in that debate, um, you should use um, the criterion or principle that all teams implicitly agree is true and important. So let's say they, they say like, oh, like legitimacy is about um, how you protect individuals or protect vulnerable individuals, let's say. So that's probably like an implicit sort of weighing point that all teams use to prove their arguments are important. You should say something like, um, the, like the metric I use to judge this debate is upon um, how teams best approximate proving that argument or proving that impact. If that's not the case, third step is to ask yourself, is there one criterion or principle that one team in the round has successfully proven to be true and important? And you use that to assess the metric of the debate or assess whether or not teams were able to take down that kind of metric from teams. Um, again, this is sort of like, um, it's like a final, um, like, like final point of like, um, like weighing basically. So if the first step doesn't work, if the second step doesn't work, then you use the third step, right? This is like um, going into bad territory here where you have to sort of kind of intervene as a judge, which is quite bad, but it happens if teams just do not disagree at, uh, or like do not agree at all on like a specific weighing metric, um, see which team was best able to, to prove the weighing of the debate or sort of also look at how teams sort of use the motion to um, make a burden in the debate or like push the burden in the debate. If none of these three steps work, including the step of how it's implied by the motion, right? 
then you should judge based on what the ordinary intelligent voter or the average reasonable voter would take to be important. So again, um, you shouldn't come into the debate um, and say something like, uh, here's how I weighed it because um, I am an average intelligent voter and I think this, this, this is true. You use this as a last alternative because this is the least objective metric of judging a debate. The most objective metric of judging a debate is based on what teams make it to be, um, what teams implicitly make it to be. If teams disagree on it, what one team was best able or most successful in, in, in metricizing. And if all that doesn't work, then you intervene in this tiny, tiny way of being an ordinary intelligent voter when you still have to be objective. Okay. So steps, um, these steps are quite important because this is a good exercise for you to become a bit more objective in the way that you judge debates. Yeah. And also note that when you use a widely applied metric, teams do not automatically lose if they fail to meet a burden, right? Judging is always a comparative exercise. So even if it's the case that three different teams say, oh, I think this metric is the most important. And let's say the opening opposition says, no, like here's a case to prove why this metric is very important and this weighs higher. They would have to prove that that, that, that metric, for example, like, like let's say they bring a fully principled case, they have to prove why that principle is more important than any other arguments or the other arguments that teams were, were using in that, in that debate. Um, if they don't do this and they, they do not compare at all, but the other teams were successfully able to compare their case to the opening opposition, then probably that means they went over the opening um, opposition, right? But the point here is we have to build up a characteristic as, as judges um, to widely apply the metric of judging the debate. Um, we can't say something like, OG wins over OO because OG proves the principle is more important than the practical, but OG loses over CO because OG's case is a um, principle argument and CO's is a practical, therefore CO wins over OG. Like we have to use the same metrics of judging, um, let's say like top half teams as we would to assess closing teams, bench team, um, like, like interbench kind of um, clashes and also closing teams, um, like, like short cross, long cross basically, right? So the point is, Whatever metric we use in debate, we use it um, fairly to all teams, basically. Okay, so what does it mean to be an active skeptic? Um, there's no really structured way to answer this, but I think there are a few things that we can ask, right? So we can ask stuff like, what do teams claim to prove? How do teams attempt to prove it, etc. The reason why I put this all jumbled up in the screen is because there isn't really a set structure, right? So. Here's what, here's what I do um, as a judge to make things easier for me, both when I justify my um, call, when I justify it to, to my panelists, or when I justify it to my chair, um, and also how I justify it to teams, right? So in the debate, I think this is always a given. Your note-taking should probably be sectioned into two different parts. So the first part is just very um, specific notes that go beyond um, just like summaries, you kind of like, like list down the, just like the mechanisms of different teams um, and you put in a lot of notes there. So that's like the very jumbled up notes. And you also have another set of notes. What I like to do is I have um, a, like a set of notes to settle clashes. So um, you'll see this later in, in the chronological structure, but the point is I, I like talk about who wins in top half what is CG's contribution and how does it win over top half or lose over top half or wins over one of those teams? Um, and I talk about closing opposition's contribution, how it compares to all the other teams, right? So that's always what I do in my OAs. There is never another way that I structure it. It's always like that. Um, so it, that makes it easy for me to settle different clashes, right? So let's say it's the opening half. Um, what is the reason for why one team wins over another, right? Um, like. Like for example, I, I talk about three, three main points of clash here. Um, first point of clash, or actually I'll go to the second point of clash really. Um, second point of clash is on accountability, right? The third point of clash is on awareness. Um, I talk a little bit about how um, OO's arguments are a bit more persuasive than the opening government's argument. Um, I talk about here what I credit from opening government, which is that they have good framing, uh, that this is a, a principal claim, for example. Um, but the principle doesn't get proven to be more important than OO's claim, whereas OO was able to prove that the practical is more important or that um, both opening a government and opening opposition reasonably um, believe that the practical is quite important, right? 
So whilst OG has an independent argument to prove a principle, that independent argument isn't weighed against OO's impacts. And since OO wins the practical impact and it was agreed by both teams, that was pretty important in the debate, that becomes a tipping point for the opening up over the opening government. Yeah. So again, it's like an exercise that you can't really say um, this team wins over another team because this team sounds like they're better or this team gives five different mechanisms, whereas the other team gives two. Um, like what you have to do is you have to just observe the debate and see how teams were able to respond to different arguments, right? So you can weigh um, like which teams won based on responsiveness. You can also weigh it based on how they prove a clash to be important. Um, and yeah, a bunch of other ways really. I'll get into more depth um, on this structure um, a bit later, yeah. But just as of right now, you have to be actively skeptical of what teams say. So um, what that means is like, let's say they have pretty good framing, but does that framing really beat out the other team? Maybe yes, maybe no, right? You have to evaluate it on a comparative basis all the time, right? So in your OA, I think it's always a good thing to say something like, they did pretty good in this respect, but unfortunately that doesn't win over this other thing because this other thing is able to outweigh it, right? So it's okay to fairly credit teams and say something like, like you did pretty well in X, but um, X loses out because um, they were able to outweigh it, right? So um, teams that lose aren't always bad teams. They're just teams that get beaten out by other good teams, right? So you can appropriately acknowledge this and appropriately also acknowledge if a weak team beats out another weak team and just say something like, while both teams didn't really give me a weighing metric, both teams generally agreed on a argument that um, is important in the round. And this one team provides some plausible reasons for why it's true. This other team only provides one specific example that doesn't really prove an argument to be true. So something like that can, can be done. Always, I think you should indicate the quality of the debate in your OA because that helps teams to correctly understand how the debate went. You shouldn't lie to them and say something like, this was an amazing debate and then give them really like, like low scores. Or you also shouldn't say something like, this was a horrible debate and then give them really high scores, right? Um, you should always be honest in your um, adjudication when you're a chair, when you're a panel, that is like sort of the best advice that I think um, you can have um, when you're judging, yeah. Okay, what does it mean to be an active skeptic as well here? Um, I guess the previous sort of slide made it seem as though there was no, no kind of step-by-step -step basis. There isn't a step-by-step -step basis, but what I wanna walk you through is just um, a general way that you can become a better active skeptic. So. Realistically, I think debating is very, very similar to how you would um, participate well or like methods to participate well in lectures, right? So it's a highly academic sport and that's why I'm using academic knowledge to tell you guys how to be better judges. So four things that you can do, um, you should prepare. Uh, by preparing, you can read the motion, you can understand what it means, um, quickly run through different core questions that need to be answered in the round, what do you think teams might bring? But also when you are in the round, you shouldn't like expect them to have to bring those things, right? Secondly, you should absorb the material primarily. So listen very, very closely, um, write down keywords, um, make sure that you identify what is a mechanism and what is just them transitioning to a mechanism. So for example, like when a team goes, I will talk about three different arguments. The first argument is about blah, blah, blah. This argument will primarily talk about blah, blah, blah. Like you don't have to write that, that like blah, 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 you just, like I think what you should just write is the title of the argument and write notes that are actually helpful for you. Um, so absorb it in a um, smart way, yeah? And also capture uh, what they're trying to say. So note take quite intelligently, like what are the main clashes? Uh, what did they contribute? What points of analysis respond to other material, et cetera? Um, and also you should review. So um, this is something that is important. So in panel discussion, you're supposed to, um, offer your perspective, but also be very, very open to what other judges want to say, right? So it's not a very good practice to um, try to like, um, how do we say, uh, like come in with a set thought that you will never ever be challenged or you will never have a different opinion, right? You might have a very strong opinion for why one team should place first, uh, but you should make it very clear what your reasons are. And if another judge convinces you that those reasons might not be very appropriate, or why maybe another clash was more important because um, a team made it to be more important, a team weighed it to be more important, et cetera. Um, you should be open to changing that, right? The point of like three person panels is, is, um, is not for the chair to just force their decision and the panelists to 
um, do nothing and just be there for show. The point of three person panels is to make sure that we get to the most average reasonable call, um, which, which comes when you accumulate the opinions and also the, um, the notes um, from, from, di from, from different people or from different judges, right? Okay, so fairly crediting teams. This is where I said you should act as their coach. And I promise guys, um, I'm, I'm gonna end quite, quite soon. So um, if you're feeling tired, don't worry. Um, we're almost, almost there. So what do we mean by fairly crediting teams? Um, so what I like to do in OAs, um, and I think it was also evident in um, this slide right here. So I'm saying like, this is what you did well, but this is what you didn't do well, or this is what you um, did well. This is how another team beat out that thing. Um, you can tell teams what they could have done to win. So you can tell them something like you prove, uh, or, or like you bring a strong argument that says X, uh, but you don't prove a critical layer of X um, and therefore, unfortunately, doesn't win, right? So if it became a tipping point as to why they lost against another team, um, you should say something like, this was a good argument. It was just not really proven to the extent that it should have been in order to win, right? You can do this by referencing burdens. So for example, in the, um, in the, in the uh, like motion that talked about like legality and also like legitimacy, um, you can say something like you prove it is illegal, but you don't prove it, it is illegitimate, right? So something like that would be um, a fair assessment of the arguments that teams make. Don't, don't come in and just say something like, um, oh yeah, you didn't prove it, so you didn't really win, or like you didn't prove it, so um, I can't credit anything to you, right? Um, that's, that's too general. Um, debate calls or debate adjudication is oftentimes very, very nuanced, so you do have to point out that nuance, yeah? Um, so don't use generalized features like style and structure for tipping points. Style and structure are sort of just things that aid in your ability to note take. Um, what you should like, like what you should, like what you should do instead, though, um, and, and this is something that I think um, is important to to flag out is style and structure is um, something that helps for you to understand why an argument is important, but it doesn't become a tipping point. What you should do is you should point out that um, like like what teams did well. And what ended up losing to another team's material, yeah. Um, and also, it's not helpful to say something like a team won because they were clearer than another team. You should find out what made it clearer. Was it that they gave empirical analysis? Was it that they gave structural reasons? Was it that they gave gave a point of weighing? Right. There obviously must be a reason for why something is analytically stronger than another thing, or a line of logic is analytically stronger than another line of logic. Right. If you can't find that thing, or you genuinely cannot um, justify it, um, and only can justify it based on the fact that a team sounded clearer, then that probably is an indication that a team is derivative, or a team um, doesn't really prove an argument beyond another team and just uses um, fancier words, right? So be very critical of yourself and are, are not, okay, like not of yourself, but rather like of your material or of your, um, like note taking um, and assess like that weighing over and over again throughout the debate and during panel discussion as well. Yeah. Um, and finally, just be actively skeptical of material within the debate. Um, you should study the manual and judge um, quite widely in order to make sure that you're fairly crediting teams. So this is what I meant by the chronological structure. So in here, what you see are, it's, it's probably not my best OA, but it is just like an OA structure, like, like the notes that I use to give an OA, um, here's the easiest way for you to always have a structure in mind that I think is the best way to credit teams and to make sure that teams um, understand the decision, right? Because that's what you're trying to do. Like you can understand why you came to that call, but um, if teams don't understand it, then it, it really isn't of, of good use to them, right? Like you're supposed to be there to explain to them what they did and how that um, beat or just like lost out to other arguments from other teams. So start off with comparing the opening half. Sometimes like, not sometimes rather, but like most times um, uh, I just take the general notes for PM and LO. But when it comes to DPM and DLO, that's where you sort of see um, which team is winning that exchange. Um, what I like to do actually is I like to take really long notes about um, different things that is said by different speakers and then give my own summary, like this, this short little summary in the end um, that explains why I thought 
uh, one opening team beat out another opening team, right? So um, basically, um, there are like two broad clashes here as to why opening government beats out opening opposition. Um, and I kind of point that out in this, in this section right here, right? So that's the first step, which team wins, OG or OO, right? And note also that like neither OG or OO was in the first. This is just you trying to go through the debate chronologically, seeing how the debate went and how teams were able to respond to other material, right? So realistically, and I'm just gonna like, well, I can't, like you guys can't see my hand, but like um, if you cover the CG and CO section, you should already have this first point up until C, like one A, B, C, you should already have all of that um, at the end of the opening exchange. So even before MG or MO talks, um, before MG talks, you should already have a pretty good idea of who won the opening exchange. Um, then you bring in closing government, right? Closing government brings an extension. The easiest way, and this is just something that you guys should try doing, is um, to write out what CG claims their extension is um, and what you found to be strong from CG or like what you found to be persuasive, just write that down. So I said, okay, CG has does three different things in the debate. They give strong rebuttal. They give an extension about how uh, you have limited resources and extension about media incentives, right? Okay, so if you already have a nice clear summary of what CG has or what CG says, then it makes it very easy to compare it to other teams, right? Um, as you listen through to the CG analysis, you might think, Hmm, maybe this is stronger than opening government. So you assess your notes um, of CG against opening government and you see, does it really take um, it over opening government or does it not, right? In this case, it did. Um, so they said a funding strategy is the best way to mitigate against falling viewership. Therefore, they better prove um, why you still get viewers in the long run versus opening government who talks about um, uh, a dedicated fan base, right? Something like that. So the easiest way I think to weigh um, closing teams against opening teams is to just talk about what their extension is um, and then weigh that extension against opening teams. If it is derivative, you say it's derivative. If they provide new mechanisms, then you talk about how um, those new mechanisms win or lose against opening government's mechanisms. Um, and then you point out how certain um, extensions maybe respond directly or indirectly to opening opposition. Right? So what I like to do is I say, bring in closing government, what are their... Uh, points of extension, and then how does this compare, right? So you first start off with a summary of closing government, and then you get into um, how they compare against other teams. Um, the reason why I do this, and the reason why you should do this as well, is because it is impossible for you to compare teams before understanding what teams provided to the debate, right? So you start off with what they provided first, and then you get into like comparison, or you can even say something like um, uh, the framing that they do and how that framing beats out or loses out to other teams, yeah. Similar thing goes for closing opposition. They give extensions and you're supposed to just weigh that extension against other teams. This is where it gets a bit tricky as to like, how do you compare CO to OG or CG or both OG and CG? The point here is just to have um, it very, very clear on what CO provides to the debate. Um, and if you are very clear on what CO provides to the debate, and since you are also clear on what CG provides, what OG provides, um, it's easier for you to compare um, that case to the specific case that each government team brings. So that's why I advocate for the chronological structure because in this way you summarize the debate very well, but you also constantly make comparisons between teams instead of just going from first to fourth because it's unclear why a team goes first if you don't explain what the team in fourth did or like, or whatnot, right? So you always start off with a chronological structure or like you use a chronological structure because it sort of outlines um, how the debate played out um, and how teams were able to beat out other teams because of how it played out, yeah? Okay, so um, this is a, a, like a very short section. There's no other slides um, after this, but I just wanted to say finally that I think um, if you want to improve as a judge, it is always good to stretch your skills. The best way to stretch your skills is to enter into spaces that are, um, I think, a bit more uncertain. So it's like if you're in, uh, like a judge in um, Indo, um, Indo judging um, is great and um, you can do a lot in Indonesian judging, right? Um, but if you want to get better, um, you should also try to see how you fare in 
um, international circuits or in other circuits, right? Because debaters from different places um, obviously like, just like debate differently, right? Judges also judge judge differently. Like maybe they prioritize certain arguments more because of cultural reasons or like they have those biases, right? The best way that I think you can become or become closer to uh, an average reasonable voter is to judge a variety of, of speakers um, in a variety of circuits as well, uh, because that lets you learn from, um, you know, people from different areas. And also it's really great to um, just branch out and try to um, get skills that you otherwise wouldn't uh, get um, in your home country or like in, in debating or judging in your home country, right? So um, there's no like, like I don't have like very specific advice here. The point is to just um, get out there and um, try your shot at international judging. Um, there are many benefits, right? As I talked about, and as you guys probably already know about, um, you get to meet a lot of great people. You get money. Money's great. Money's fun. Um, and every other thing as well as fun, like getting better at debating um, and also learning about debating from really great speakers and really great judges. So um, a huge plus to do international judging because, um, yeah, you get all of those benefits. So that's about it, really. Um, I hope all of you guys enjoyed this um, presentation. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them right now. Um, yeah. So I'll just stay here for um, anyone who has any questions. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Jira, while we wait. I personally have a question. It is regarding um, contradictions in the debate. So uh, mostly in debates, debaters don't notice that they, uh, they did make contradictions. And when we don't necessarily mention it in our MOA, they will, it will affect our judging feedback because they will think like, oh, they did, uh, the judges did not take into account my speech or uh, the context that I brought, even if it's contradictive. Um, isn't it preferable to just mention it on the OA that there there were contradiction, hence we cannot necessarily credit it, or um, it's just a part of the convention that the judge should not at all talk about the contradictions except for feedback out of the OA session? Right, um, that's a good question, and I think this is just a, a way to clarify it. By ignore, I just mean you ignore it in the way that you credit teams. So it's like if a contradiction is made, you can just say it in your OA, like this was a contradiction um, because of this reason and also because another team maybe pointed it out. Um, so that doesn't become the metric for judging the debate. What becomes a metric is this. Um, I think it is always a good thing to point that out in the OA. Uh, because what it does is it limits the scope of your adjudication. So it's like you're telling teams, here's what became important. And you cannot, you can't really say what is important if you say, like, if you don't say what is unimportant, right? So you have to first start off with like, um, here's the stuff that um, teams talked about. Um, here's the stuff that became important in this um, comparison. Um, so I think it's always good to point out that contradiction. The other thing as well is whenever we, credit contradictions, right? Or not credit, but rather like encounter contradictions. The thing to do is to ignore the contradictory like material, but to credit the first material that isn't contradictory. So it's like if the first speaker gives analysis, second speaker contradicts it, ignore second speaker's analysis that is contradictory and take what first speaker provides. Um, so that's essentially it. I hope that answers it, yeah. All right, thanks, Judah. Oh, there's a question from Curtis. The question is, is weighing metric of a chemistry motion more important or the metric all sides agreed on? Um, all right, so can I just clarify what you mean by a chemistry motion? Because um, I'm not really sure about that. Um, if you'd like to clarify that. Um, oh, okay, okay. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, so. Is the weighing metric of a character motion more important or the metric all sides agreed on? Um, all right, so I think that is a question on what type of motion it is, right? So it's like, um, is it a this house prefers motion? This house believes that, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think it is always important that that is taken into account when you're judging the debate. And I also like, I, I honestly think that is the first step uh, is to just read the motion and to know what the motion asks for you to defend. That I think is more important because um, 
if like, um, okay, this is like the worst case scenario, right? If a team, if, if four teams in the debate that says this house as the US uh, would do X, if all four teams argue that um, this is to the interest of general morally good things instead of the US, um, that is a bad debate. And that is a debate that you probably have to score teams or speakers um, low for because they don't really debate the motion, they debate on general metrics. What this means is that in your adjudication or in your decision for certain teams to win over other teams, you can probably say that this was the widely applied metric because all teams agreed that this is um, how you should assess the debate. But what you also have to do is you also have to say that this just wasn't to the motion, which therefore means teams by and large didn't really get really high scores um, or the scores just um, would, would like reflect the quality of the debate, right? So sort of like a like like two things that you have to do. So you, you assess the debate based on um, the metric that all sides agree on, uh, but you also assess the debate based on um, what, what is the debate actually about, right? Um, I would say that you first have to look at what the motion says um, in order to know what the debate is about. And then you also look at um, the things that teams agreed upon to determine rankings and determine which, which teams go above other teams, yeah? And also the quality of the debate, right? Because the quality of the debate um, can sometimes be different or in most cases is different to just the reasons for why teams rank over each other, yeah? Um, so that would be my answer to that question. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or if you'd like to follow up? All right, that's, there is a question from Vaness. What is the call on closing team that won on somewhat new material on the web? Because some said that should it that shouldn't be fair because it is late, but some sources said it is okay, albeit less persuasive. Yeah, um, good question. Uh, when we're talking about new material from WIP, um, you have to ask, is it new material or is it just new responses? Um, if it's new responses, obviously like you can credit it. Um, if it is entirely new material, you have to ignore it. And I think that's just what the rules say. Uh, if it's like a totally new argument, you can't credit it. If it's um, a totally new piece of analysis that you cannot reasonably infer from the previous speaker in that team, you also have to ignore it. Um, that's the rule. My suggestion is when that does happen uh, for you, um, I think what is best to do is to just critically observe and be an active skeptic. Is this material like, um, like a response? Is this material a completely new argument? Um, be like very, very clear on how you categorize it and why you categorize it as such. Um, if you think that the material is in your response, you have to justify it. Like you can probably just say something like, um, oh, this is a response because this is what the um, other team said and this is what uh, the whip said is um, in response to that argument, right? Something like that would probably justify um, crediting stuff from the whip. But the rule is just that if, if it's completely new material, like a new argument, there's no other way around it. You just have to not credit it. Um, so that's what it says, yeah? All right, uh, thank you for that question. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? It can be totally unrelated as well to um, the, the presentation, like anything about judging is completely fine. All right, while we wait, probably I want to ask some questions that might be useful for a lot of judges or um, novice judges here. Um, what are your suggestions to make our judging CV or resume much more interesting and much more um, packed, but at the same time strategic, not taking judging jobs that are like not prestigious enough, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, I see. Um... I feel like there isn't a rule for this. Um, like, I think judging is just fun. And in the same way that we do debates, we do debates because it's fun, right? Um, I think most of us do. Um, that is quite subjective. But also, I think what is important here is um, you should try your shot at 
multiple types of tournaments, right? So I think when I started off, um, I started off judging a schools tournament, um, Smanta Jupulo. Um, what is this? Um, Smanta Jupulo debate competition. That was my first judging gig. Um, and yeah, from there on, like I just tried out my, like my hand on different judging um, opportunities. So like realistically, I think you can, um, like you should just do the things that you want to do. Like you just judge whatever you want to. I think it's always nice to have a good mix of like tough tournaments as well as um, uh, smaller tournaments, you know, that you can ask for really detailed feedback from the CA from. Um, but definitely, I think it's very important that if you do want to judge widely or if you want to, I guess what some people call be a career judge, judge the big tournaments because that's where you'll like actually learn or that's where you'll like get the experience that you need to get. Um, it is obviously very, very um, tough. Um, and I think the first time you do it, you might actually feel like you hate judging. Um, but the point is that is a process, right? And you're supposed to learn from that process. And I also think it shouldn't be the case that you define your entire judging abilities on um, one tournament in the same way that you should never judge your debating abilities based on one tournament. So sometimes what I had, um, like what I had previously because I was judging for a year, um, I would judge this small tournament in the UK or I did judge a small tournament in the UK um, and I didn't break, um, and it was a very, very small tournament. Um, and a lot of CAs would also call it a slightly less competitive judge pool. Uh, but then I was able to um, say, break at other tournaments that were a bit better, right? So, um, which is the same thing as, as debating, right? Like you could probably um, not do very well in a small tournament, but then you do well in a really good tournament. Um, it varies, but the point is that you should weigh against that like variability by doing tournaments and like practicing a bit more and perfecting your um, skills in judging. So that's like the primary thing is you is if you come in with the intention to be a better judge, um, the CV or the good CV will like get to you anyway. Yeah. I see. Um, uh, based on cultural differences, would you suggest approaching the debaters for feedback, maybe after an OA? So at, like, as opposed to Judge, uh, debaters asking for feedback to you, asking them for feedbacks. Um, do any debating circuit usually do that? Um, personally, I don't see any um, attempts in Indonesian debating circuit. Maybe you have some overview. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, that's a like nice question, and honestly, a question that I don't um like I can't really answer because I think like um it's always a good thing to ask for feedback. It's it's best. I think like the first. Thing to do or the best thing to do is to just ask the CA for feedback. So um, ask the CA for like a compilation of your judge feedback. The numerical score isn't very helpful. What is more helpful is just the comments that teams provide. So CAs can oftentimes just tell you like, oh, this team felt like, or like not this team, but rather like teams generally felt like their material wasn't really credited. Uh, if that's the case, maybe you should try to um, integrate more of your, um, like, like more of their words verbatim into the OA. Um, and explain to them their case first in the way that they explained it. And then you explain how you weighed that. Um, maybe that's like a strategy that you can use. Um, CA feedback I found to be very, very helpful. Sometimes I think approaching debaters for feedback, like I think you can do it and I've, I've seen it done before. I just don't think it's the um, best thing to do. Um, you should always be open to giving feedback though. Uh, I think as a judge, right? Because if you give feedback to debaters, they oftentimes can also voice out their concerns to you. Um, so it's like uh, if if teams don't know how you settled the clash or it was like if it was a bit unclear in the OA, they'll probably ask you like, what do you think about this, right? And, and like, you should just answer, like, here's what I thought. Um, I also think that if teams don't really want to voice out their concerns to you, they wouldn't um, anyway. So it's like, if you ask them for feedback on your judging, it's not really helpful if they're they're not willing to give you feedback on it um, anyway, right? So the point is just like, I think it's best to judge um, as best as you can, um, offer feedback if teams ask for it and um, ask the CAP for feedback as well and to learn from different, um, you know, judge training videos that are available online because there are a bunch of them as well. All right, awesome. 
I guess that answer wraps up our meeting tonight. There's no more other questions um, for you guys who came late to the seminar. Don't worry because we will publish this video on our YouTube channel. And if you are interested for other seminars and judging of BPAP or other materials that you would like to see in the seminar, you can just um, fill in the Google form that we have sent and join our um, group community group all right um thank you judah for attending tonight's meeting and sharing your thoughts with us and insights i'm pretty sure it's going to be super useful uh for a lot of us novice judges and who's trying to uh, be more focused on this more oh there's a question from chloe are there any asian debate tournaments coming up judah maybe you would like to promote any competitions you're ca right now oh um, unfortunately not. I'm only seeing BP tournaments as of right now. Um, but you should just check the global spreadsheet. Um, or also Disputandum also has um different tournaments advertised in your uh um like website. I think so. Do check those out. Um, if you'd like to attend any AP tournaments. All right. Um. Yes. If you'd like, if you're interested in any AP tournaments, you can check. Um. Probably the Asia Debating Facebook group or follow our instagram because we post them once in a while okay thank you everyone i will end the meeting see you on our next seminar good night or good morning